Hello, this is the December 8th FreeBSD OCI call. This is a call that sprouted out of the weekly jail calls and may repeat on a regular schedule or maybe it won't. So far we have Levi, Jan, Chris, Doug, John, Antrenig, and myself, Michael. Hopefully others will join. But I very much wanted to start with introductions and our special guest of the hour is Doug, could you introduce yourself and a little about your projects relating to FreeBSD? Well, so my relationship with FreeBSD goes back a really long way. Um, I was a user of the patch kit back in the day. Um, I was invited to join FreeBSD as a committer around the 2.0 timeframe when we were trying to recover from the at t lawsuit. So, um, over the years, I've worked on a lot of stuff, did quite a bit of work on NFS, um, worked on the device framework work, which ended up being called Newbus, which is a terrible name. Um, kernel object um, API, which is part of the foundation for Newbus that's used in quite a few places. Um, a lot of kernel work. I did the alpha port, uh, did the IA64 port, neither of which still exist, but I think they was, both of them are important for different ways and different reasons. Um, I've had a lot of gaps, you know, real life gets in, in the way sometimes. And I spent probably the last, I'm, I'm going to say from 2010 to end of 21 in industry without any free time. I worked for Google, I worked for Facebook, I worked in high frequency trading in the city. And I got to the end of that cycle and think, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to do the things that, I mean, the work was interesting, but it fundamentally it wasn't the projects I wanted to work on. Um, but they had all paid quite reasonable compensation. I'd saved up a, a bunch of money. I thought, I can, I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to do things that actually interest me for a while. And one of the things that has particularly interested me for a long time um, is the container infrastructure that started with Docker and it's kind of broadened out from there. Um, we nearly had a Docker port in 2015, but upstream killed it. That really pissed me off at the time. Um, anyway, so I wanted to see how far I could get with FreeBSD along this, this container road. Um, I picked up the Podman kind of port, which is a workalike for Docker. It's a completely separate implementation, but it um, and it has some pros and cons, but it's um, it looked like it was going to be a good fit. Um, I tried to port it and actually got some stuff working. So that was cool. Um, Sam's um, work on Run J really helped to get me started there. And I learned a lot from um, reading his code and trying to use it. But he has specific reasons for, for um, controlling access to that code. He treats it as his own personal learning experience, which I completely respect. Uh, so to unblock myself and to be respectful for his boundaries, I made my own OCI runtime, which I called OCI Joe because I can't name things very well. <laughs> and that thing is optimized for Podman, basically. I, I'm not really a big fan of Containerd. I don't have any strong opinions against it, but it's kind of for desktop, I don't like the idea of having a big demon in the background. Podmon is nice in that it's a lot like a, a lot, some of our you know, existing jail infrastructure. If you start up a workload, it runs, it sets up the workload, gets it running, and then goes away. It doesn't have to have a, a, a long-term large process. So anyway, worked on that for most of 22, I think, and large part of this year. And I've been broadening out from there to support some of the infrastructure for Kubernetes. And uh, I have a prototype two node Kubernetes cluster in my lab, which is kind of cool. But it's kind of, it's getting towards what I would call suitable for low priority production, not critical. There are some stumbling blocks. Um, we really need to have project owned container images for the base system. That's a kind of a credibility gap. If you come, I had a few conversations along the way of like, hey, would you like to, um, you know, I've ported your thing um, 
and they look at it and say, what's this base image from some weird account on Cray.io that, you, that that's just you? Can't we have a freebsd.org owned thing? So I want to fix that. And, you know, I've had some good conversations with Ed Master and other people around that. And I'm from, I think we have a good way forward. Package base being supported by the FreeBSD org infrastructure now is a real big step forward. Um, yeah. I'm going to say some rando. It's Doug Rabson. It was, so it's it's not some <laughs> it's your own. Okay. Random, random third party that I picked out of the air. But yeah. Got it. Got um, it. I wasn't clear. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> so the, the other part is that standardization is important. We have a couple of implementations of OCI runtime now. Um, they're somewhat divergent in the way that we approach the command line API and some of the extensions. So we need to have um, some consensus on how how to describe a FreeBSD jail or, or, or the other resources that we take from FreeBSD in the OCI runtime. And that process is just getting started. Um, so the, there's a fairly formal process um, that's owned by the open container group. And I think we're scheduled for, a, we're, we're proposed a working group to um, explore <clears throat> how a FreeBSD extension to the spec would look like. Um, I don't see any reason why that won't go ahead. They're gonna call a vote on the, the OCI next week and then we'll get things moving. There's quite a, quite a lot of interest um, on that direction. Um, things that I think I'd like to cover, obviously how to describe a jail that's suitable for this workload, um, how to describe resource limitations. We have resource um, control our CTL, which works for this, but we need to describe uh, that in the the config for, for a container to say, hey, this guy wants X CPU, Y memory, and so on. So there's a few bits and pieces. It's actually not that big, um, but it's important to get consensus so that we don't have runtimes going off in different directions, just doing different things for the sake of it. If, if we all agree and we actually talk, then we can have interchangeable runtimes. So that's kind of where I am. I felt like I've gone on a long way. <laughs> it's more than an introduction, but I will. It is perfect. And let's, I guess, hold off on the technical questions, but uh, keep them coming. And it's very helpful that you're pasting them in context. Uh, welcome, Greg. We were simply doing introductions and uh, Doug has just taken care of that. Uh, Chris, to not broadside Greg, would you like to introduce yourself briefly? Uh, uh sure. Hi. Uh, hey. Oh wait, yeah, which Greg? Oh, no, no, I it's you. Greg Sorry, just I, I, one I, Greg just finished. <laughs> uh, unless <laughs> you want to dive in, I'll let you two decide out if if you're ready. So, not Craig, please go ahead. Uh, okay. Yeah. Hey. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Greg Wallace. I work at the FreeBSD Foundation. And um, yeah, I'm. I'm sorry. I'm a little late. No worries about that. We were simply going through Doug's introduction. Uh, Chris, go ahead. I am Chris Mertz. I am here as a volunteer to support the Beehive and. JL's work stream and the enterprise working group, which was founded by Greg. And maybe Greg also wants to say a little bit more about the enterprise working group. But then again, I think <clears throat> the majority, if not all attending probably know about that already. So I guess we don't have to go into that into too much detail. That is a good observation. Uh, let's see. Others, uh, we have largely users here. My name's Michael. I've simply been coordinating coordinating these calls and was the first Beehive user outside of NetApp. Um, anyone else want to jump in as a user and introduce yourselves? Okay, so we have questions for Doug. Let's dive into those. Uh, we'll go in sequence. Jan, you had some questions about the uh, it concerns about container D. So I, 
I don't have, have real concerns about containerd itself, but the, it's the paradigm um, for desktop use. I don't really want to have to have to have a large daemon running in the background. That's traditionally the way Docker has worked, and containerd is basically an evolution of that. Um, and Podman struck me as a nicer alternative for single machine workloads that don't need a daemon. Um, so that's kind of why, why I started looking at it. Also, I found the, the owners of Podman and the other you know, things are, so, uh, are part of that in, infrastructure to be really receptive to taking on quite large amounts of change from a random person off the internet saying, I want to make this lot work on FreeBSD. That, they, they've been really supportive. And, and there were already people working on ContainerD for FreeBSD. So I thought, you know, I'm going to get out of their way um, I'm going to do the Podman thing because I think it has its own merits, and that would think that has been very productive. So basically, the the only technical difference to me that I feel feel like is important is that Podman doesn't require a daemon to be running long term. It has a tiny comms. De um, program associated with each container called Conmon that basically archives the input and output and manages access to the to the console terminal. And that's it. What um, was the name of that that's handling the access? Con, it's a thing called Conmon. It's part of the background. It's not something you'd ever use yourself, but basically it it, it monitors the life cycle of the container and it mediates access to things like stud.io to um, the console, because for long running containers, you can actually give them a TTY and you can just connect to that and attach them. So that's that's all managed by Conmon. It's a small C program. There's a, a, a Rust implementation as well, but I use the C one. Uh, that said is, have you found that say the jail infrastructure makes that easier unlike on other platforms such that it, you know, this isn't a problem to be solved in the same way it's solved elsewhere? I think what I like about jails is that compared to Linux namespaces is that it's, this is both a pro and a con, but it, all of the different pieces are rolled up into the jail. You, you create a jail and you say, I want a VNet, I want um, this DevFS, I want this and that and the other. And it's all kind of one piece. Whereas the Linux alternative, you create namespaces for each of the different things. You have a PID namespace and a network namespace, and you kind of join them all together. And the container has to, there's a bit of a dance around the container has to be joined into all of the, the right namespaces for it to work. And it seems jail feels a little easier to work with, um, especially when I look at the amount of code to required to manage namespaces for, for on the Linux side. So yeah, I think jail ends up being a bit cleaner on the API side, but probably a bit more limited because of that. Any follow-up questions? The Linux questions namespaces related, thing is kind okay. of, I mean, the Linux namespaces is kind of a, sort of a Lego set for for building uh, a different different patterns for different workloads. And jail is a bit more restricted, I suppose. Yeah. Any follow up questions before we get to the others listed? Then Jan asks, where do you and others picture official FreeBSD images living? You know, be, would it be at I'm guessing simply FreeBSD official base images, or what do you see it perhaps an ecosystem and a, a so shopping mall of different use cases? Right. Go ahead. I'm thinking that the, the, the most important thing for me is base images. Like, um, so I want, you know, I want to run a workload. It's a FreeBSD workload. It's a shell, it's a shell workload. So I need an image that's going to give me the shells and the libraries and things like that. And um, so I feel like that level, and there's there's a lot of, it, all the Linux distros have, you know, images of different sizes. There's typically a minimal one, which is only very limited functionality, but you can install things into it and other, you know, broader things. So I think something like that, um, a, a small group of focused images, the kind of ones that I've been using in testing are just enough to support uh, a statically linked binary that does SSL, so just certificates. The next one would be 
all the dynamic libraries for doing that same kind of thing, but dynamically linked. Again, no shell. So you can have a tiny, tiny image with a small attack surface. Um, then what else, whatever else we need to, to run shell scripts, and that's conveniently one of the package base um, packages does that for us. And then kind of working up from there. So a handful of, of small images um, and possibly a, a kind of one equivalent to the, the traditional FreeBSD install, which is based on TXZ. But that's kind of a, that's a bulky image. That's a gigabyte unpacked. Whereas oh, a lot of the images I yes. want to work with. Yeah, a, a lot of the images I'm building are less than 100 megabytes, substantially less in, in a lot of cases. And I like the idea of having small, um, small images that you don't have to waste a lot of bandwidth downloading. And in terms of where should they go, um, Docker, Do Docker Hub is a, actually a reasonable place. And there is a FreeBSD project member that owns docker.io slash FreeBSD and is holding that to, until we get to the point of being able to produce, to when I say we, for release engineering to, be able to produce images that they sign and the project owns and then they can be uploaded to docker hub um, along with the signatures and be provably a provable chain of custody from the project it would be straightforward for us to run a, um, an image registry an oci image registry is a low low kind of complexity thing there's a few different implementations of the docker registry i use something called zot which is which is a bit more it has a little web front end, which I find useful. Do Docker registry is fine though. So we could have a project, something on like registry.freebsd.org or whatever you want to call it. But Docker Hub would be fine too, as long as there is a clear chain of custody. Does that answer your question? To those who yes. asked, yes, and I see some questions like is follow up is the FreeBSD name held in trust at Docker Hub? Is that a, a uh, I think that was the community? what you just said that yeah. the project member holds the name uh so FreeBSD project some... member or a Docker a FreeBSD project oh, member. Excellent. Good. Uh moving on, alternate, go ahead and vocalize your question. Uh, yeah, greetings all. Um, my question is, well, I mean, the, the whole background of the story is the reason why Docker was created is because of like the whole, of, of course, containers are, are nice, but the main problem that mm -hmm. he tried to solve initially is the, the packaging problem in Linux, because Linux specifically yeah. had a packaging problem, which is not true of a, any other Unix-like operating system. We all have more like single and way mature packaging systems uh, that you know, you, I can easily ship a PKG to a customer and they would be totally happy for, for that, but try sending a dev file and now you're in a whole yeah. mess comparatively yeah. at least. Um, but then I'm, I'm looking at OCI and of course it, it looks very nice. And I'm, I've been thinking, is it also, is OCI also created to solve these specific issues that the Linux container world is having, and maybe there are arguments to not support OCI on FreeBSD. And I'm not talking as a port, of course. I'm talking mm -hmm. like if this project goes into base, for example. Yeah. Uh, so uh, does the question make sense? I hope. I think it makes sense. Um, I want to address the the distro problem. There's a million and one Linux distros. And actually that's one big reason, as you say, that why why um, containers came about because packaging a random distro that could actually run on a different distro is non-trivial. So there were, that was a problem that they were solving. We don't have that problem at that scale, but we still have, we still have several supported versions of FreeBSD. I mean, on a, on my network, if I have a FreeBSD current thing, it can easily run containers that were built for 14.0, for 13.2, and so on. So we have a tiny, tiny subset of that. And I think, but it's still an important thing. So I can run a container that was built with a 
base image from 13.2 um, and it's the same as the as a self-contained image with everything that's needed to have that running safely and so kind of the same as as literally everybody using jails does already like if you if i do the same thing with io cage you, you pick the release version build take the base image and build your stuff on top of that um, in terms of in base um, nothing is actually necessary to have in base um, other than kind of things working like i had to make a, a kernel change to support uh port mapping for podman but that was a gap that was there for um other gel infrastructures so i was i found the same bug in bastille um so you know that was just a feature gap in freebsd nothing for nothing ne needs to be in the base system for oci everything is in ports you can just install the packages and it runs on top of the um, standard gel infrastructure. So then to Antonik's point, is the OCI model truly providing unique value or is it just providing an, a, an audience perhaps? So where I see it adds value and this, you can see this on the Linux side is that by having a standard that people agree to that, that people have spent some care in defining by having an interface that, that people agree on, you can have a diversity of implementations. So there are lots of different um, implementations of the runtime on uh, that address things in different ways, maybe using uh, Linux namespaces or running lightweight virtual machines or what have you. Um, the standard itself also allows for diversity across operating systems explicitly. There are definitions for how it should work on Solaris, how it should work on ZOS, how it should work in different environments. and. Um, yeah, I think that that agreeing on an interface, especially when there's a lot of different groups involved, is enormously important. And this is this would allow for um, interoperability be between different jail based e ecosystems if we if we could get this far. And for instance, I could be, if if everybody agreed on the on the interfaces, I can build an image with a workload and have it running on some Bastille OCI. Um, extension or something i don't see why that wouldn't, wouldn't be doable oh, but within yeah, freebsd I trust. With it, yeah yeah um as part of the question was running random um things off of docker hub i wouldn't personally run linux images it's possible we can emulate them but i wouldn't want to support that <laughs> Because upstream is certainly not going to support that. When you ask, oh, I'm running your Linux image on a FreeBSD system, the no, conversation will stop there. So, yeah. I, yeah. Would it make sense to define a flag uh, to basically say this Linux image is supposed to run under FreeBSD's Linux ABI? So, basically, this is just a div one image. Right. Uh, and it doesn't require a PID one and stuff like this, and shouldn't use we, any we, of the we implemented have, system parts. Yeah, we, so we, could, can we could compile that. a list. Yeah, yeah, no, I got, got a got list, to say. but yeah, yeah. this should support basically a free PSD implementation of the Linux ABI. Hmm. So that you could say, my container should work. I've tested it. You remember Cloud ABI from a few years ago in the various PSD oh, clients? Oh, that was... Uh, <laughs> Very good idea, which certainly FreeBSD wasn't quite ready at the time, but that would totally take us off the rails because uh, I looked at it and yeah. the things holding it back techno technology-wise are fixed now. Ah, interesting. It's okay, I don't want to derail question. this, but that was an attempt to get that right. And yeah, maybe it's ahead of its time. Oh yes, uh, but also, now that not everyone is running AMD 64 anymore, um, it's also less relevant. The uh, allure of uh, Cloud ABI at the time was that both uh, Linux, uh, FreeBSD, and macOS, and potentially Windows um, supported um, AMD 64 as instruction set, as the instruction set. Right. And 
because of a way you invoke system calls, you can have a almost zero cost emulation mode to uh, hook it through user space system call emulation, because you always go through a pointer to a table of function calls. Okay. So that you well, could have a zero cost on... macOS and so on. Let's hold off on Cloud ABI reminiscing <laughs> until later. Uh, and for your next question, Jan, you mentioned package base, and I'll add to that. Should one so, jump to package base, in your opinion, uh, Doug, or well, it's still just one strategy? So to get to my These question, good questions. Uh, right now, if you use package base at all, basically you can install a full user land and you get on 14 AMD 64, that's like 417 packages. Uh, mm -hmm. You can uh, create untold billions of potential subsets of that, which is will run some in some way or shape. But um, the problem is if we want to not uh, die out of the combinatorial explosion, we have to uh, give port maintainers something to target so that they can say, I support this, let's say, FreeBSD minimal or something uh, without yeah. compilers, without man documentation, without um, debug symbols and yep. so on. Yep, exactly. So and Because if FreeBSD, especially 40 now, but Clang has been bumped yet again and so on, has gotten quite fat for a container workload where you frequently right. create thick container instances. Right. So let let Doug get catch up on those. So um, if you look within that that group of four hundred packages or so, um, the uh, so I'll address I'll address the meta packages first. Um, there's strong opposition to meta packages in the maintainers of package base. I don't fully understand why, but you'll get pushback if you ask for meta packages. <laughs> Um, so you, if you want to make a case for it, then you're going to have to have a, a pretty clear reason why this would be a good direction to go in, because otherwise I don't think that conversation is going to, going to go there very well. Um, it's very polite, but you know, every, I've had small suggestions on tiny, tiny meta packages of grouping two or three things together and always had pushback from that. So leaving that aside. Within the group of 400 packages, um, the dependencies, it's like library dependencies, the most important thing, but the, they're, they're managed by package really well. Um, there are provides and requires sections in all of the, the images. So if I install, I don't know, Kerberos or something, it will definitely pull in all the Kerberos libs and whatever else is necessary to make that work. Where I think there's probably a gap is installing something from the ports ecosystem like say i install nginx will that pull any if will it that pull the right packages from package base and i think the answer right now is no but if we could close that gap then um installing a port should pull in bits of package base that it needs for its own functionality and that should be managed by the requires mostly managed by the required libs and you know um exported libs features on the on both sides so i think there's there's a bit of work to, to do to make that um work really is well. that not the but oldest, i think that's possibly the direction is that not the oldest package and port question ever <laughs> yeah there is so a fundamental the, change of the interface between yeah yeah, yeah base and uh, base. package because suddenly base uh disassembles into uh, individual uh, dependencies you have to track. But you don't, you don't, with the required packages thing that the package um, command supports, you don't have to be, you don't have to know which package supplies it as long as something does. And install time, mm -hmm. if package can't resolve, then it will tell you. Um, it's different from the traditional ports model where there are explicit dependencies on everything that you um, that your package that your port depends on. It's definitely different. 
Um, but I think the alternative within package base would be a, a, a pretty, pretty difficult thing. To, we'd have to construct the hard dependencies. And yeah. Okay. But I don't know. I, I don't have a complete answer to this. I'm on the outskirts of the package based project. I fix things when I when they when something I care about is broken, but I don't fully understand the reasons why we've gone in these directions. And that would be a question for another group of people, I think. Manu particularly. Amen. Uh, shall we move on to other questions? Chris, you brought up NanoBSD as perhaps an example. I I'm just wondering really, whether that would yeah. be of use. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, that's a good question. NanoBSD solves a completely different problem. It is written in the bad old days when we had compact flashcards with uh, write cycles in the uh, tr triple digits Correct. or something. And the solution to that was that you base and no support for things like CFS and boot environments. So it's like a um, poor man's appliance only boot environment by using the old master boot record active partition label to mm -hmm. switch between uh, two full system images so that you can basically treat your root file system like a firmware image on a dual image yep. switcher Correct. router. Yep. And, and it the did configuration well. lives on a read-only file system, which is, I don't remember exactly, it's either only mounted if you want to yep. write back to it yep. and copied into an MFS or tempfs at boot, or normally mounted read-only and you can mount it read-write shortly and then go back. Correct. Because Let's save memory lane for all... later. And I've tried to outline a bunch of those historic uh, previous art and my little page here that I'll just point to and then escape from. But you'll notice at the bottom, there is a, a rundown of the prior art. So I, I start with NanoBSD. And so let's let's uh, deep dive separately on those. Anyway, so uh, Doug, your thoughts in response to Chris's question. So, yeah, I think, I mean, I, I've never really looked closely at nano bsd but as i understood it was wasn't how you described it. it's it's an interesting thing it's it kind of it's trying trying to be a bit broader than than rescue but it's actually pr producing really tiny images and that's but it, in terms of what i find useful for building images um package base has been a real big help there um i can like if i'm if I want to just have an, an image with a few shared libraries that everything will need, I know exactly the package I need to install, FreeBSD CLibs, um, possibly adding some certificates on top, um, and package base, especially with with the package uh, command line tool, I can um, point it at a particular ch root subtree and build images into that and then freeze them as an OCI image. This works really well. Um, just using shell scripts running off the off the running you know, package and and other container based packaging tools to to these things together. So yeah, package bases has been a big help in building um, defining small libraries and building them consistently. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Sure, and I, I invite you to, to take, a, BSD. take a peek. That was me uh, fixing build options over the course of about five years because many had gone stale and no one noticed because they always performed a standard build. So I excluded everything, brought back the required ones, and then worked with developers to get those fixed. And they've been working since 13, and I'm grateful for that. So have a peek, I suppose. Uh, Chris, again... Uh, bu, 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 OCI across multiple nodes uh, from a deployment perspective, clustering perspective. What's behind your question, Chris? Uh, yeah, primarily um, whether the tooling would already. I mean, is is it already there? I don't know. I mean, what's 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 the state of uh, of your work so far? Yeah. That's a very valid so, question. 
That's a really great question. Um, there's within Podman, and um, I think probably con the container the infrastructure as well. With it, there's a, a fairly well defined API that is typically accessed using SSH tunnels, either connecting to a local socket or on the local machine or an SSH tunnel to to some remote machine. This is a thing called Podman Remote, and I think Docker supports this this type of access as well. So on my desktop, I can have, you know have a VM that's running current or something, another VM that's running fourteen, and I can use Podman Remote to interact with them. It's not it's not a shared cluster. It's me on the command line telling it which which node to talk to. It's kind of manual, but it works and it works really well. And this is how people run um, Linux containers from their Mac desktop. It runs a VM virtual machine. Podman remote SSH is in creates an SSH tunnel to the, that machine and runs the workload using Linux images. This is a place where you actually do have a long running binary because something's got to be the other end to talk to with Podman remote. It's strictly optional. If you're not doing this, you don't have to do that. Um, on a more kind of raw experimental direction. Um, I've been porting parts of the Kubernetes infrastructure, which does provide a cluster experience that does kind of allow the, just the nodes to join the cluster and have workloads automatically scheduled to them. Um, I have this working in my lab. There's a lot of work to get this thing reviewed um, and pushed upstream. Um, but I think there's potential there. In my experimentation with it, it's worked really well with jails and OCI. Um, the control plane already builds out of the box for um, FreeBSD and other people have been using that already. There's even a FreeBSD port for the control plane components. Oh. I just ported some of the, the, there's a thing called Kubelet, which runs on each node that talks to the, the um, runtime, that talks to the, the management components and they tell it what to do. So they start up this container with this image with these parameters. So it's kind of a um, that's one of the things that I worked on porting. Um, and that talks to the OCI runtime through a well-defined interface that allows for some diversity of implementations like various um, virtual machine based approaches. OCR runtime based approaches and so on. So the back end for that is a thing called Cryo, which is a container runtime interface. And I don't want to know what the dash O comes from. But this is basically an implementation using some of the parts that come from the pod running infrastructure to build the API that, that Kubernetes expects to use to manage its containers. So I've got a port of cryo and i'm upstreaming that um those guys have been reasonably um supportive of the of the, the project so once that's done i'll produce a port for it getting the kubernetes parts reviewed is going to involve a bit more politics than i'm comfortable with because there's a it's a big project and they like things to be done the right what they think of as the right way so we'll have to work that work through that. Political is probably the wrong word. I mean, they they do things in a certain way, and I need to learn their ways so to get generic question. Out. Maybe to Chris, how how can how can the foundation make that easier? Because if if Doug is willing to do that level of work. Making it hard to get that code pushed seems <laughs> 180 degrees backwards. Basically, hey, I, I don't know if you meant Chris or Greg. Um, well, but, either um, way, sorry. No, you're fine. I'd like no, it's all good. And I mean, Chris probably has more intelligent thoughts than I do. Um, but 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 you read my mind, right? Like literally, that's exactly what I was thinking. Is um, you know when 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 it you know when the time is right, Doug. Uh, 
let me know, right? And um, sure. I can't I can't make any promises other than I will do my best, but I do actually know a lot of people over there. Um, and yeah. uh, and and at least I can, uh, you know, hopefully make that as as smooth as possible. And 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 Basically, I will absolutely take that on. Yeah, yeah, that that's I really appreciate that. I mean, what's going through my mind is basically what what I'm doing as all through all of this is working to try and impose change on an external project. And the Podman, the work on to get Podman working uh, was quite large, and there was pushback from that. And I managed their expectations. I explained what what I felt were the risks to them and how I felt that my approach was going to mitigate those risks, that um, I would always be around to fix issues or help review, you know, changes where they intersect this work. And it's about building credibility. So their perceived risk is managed. And I worked through that process with the Podman folks, but I haven't even started it with Kubernetes. And it's the same problem. Basically, um, I'd be asking them to make changes to some of their most sensitive core components to support something which they fundamentally don't at this point care about, which because Linux is the world to them. So we have to manage that and make sure that it's the code that we send upstream is of a decent quality, that it's not going to break their stuff, that we actually test it against Linux before sending it upstream, um, that we um, accept the fact that they're taking on some risks and help to find how, ways to manage that risk. So yeah, it's a process. Politics is it's not the right word. Mm -hmm. It's trying to convince somebody that I'm not going to yep. break their stuff. Right. Yeah, and it's it's also, you know, it's it's when there's a when there's a significant difference between your priorities and their priorities and and trust right. me, I've 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 been dealing with that a lot. <laughs> um so uh and and but it is it is our priority and uh and i really appreciate the insight and perspective and mm. uh obvious persistence that you've put into this so um yeah like i'm 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 very much uh on that page and sort of mm -hmm. at your disposal so just just say the word and uh and i'll i'll swing into action and do everything i can to help great uh let's I just punch through technical questions and uh, you know, broaden when we've satisfied those. John, you were curious about security scanning relating to perhaps uh, an upstream ecosystem or what? Um, it was less a question than it was a just a statement. Um, I know that, at least for us, um, we have to run security scans on everything um, at, for product requirements. And we end up, our, our IT department also comes in and says, hey, did you know that you guys are, you know, pulling this much data, blah, blah, blah. And we end up pulling repositories local. And once the repositories are local, um, we then typically, the, the secondary step is, we spend a lot of time building that image that we need to use. So we end up building a, a, a base operating system that has everything contained within it already, such that when we bring it up, we, we go from, you know, we, we can spend over an hour trying to build a dynamic, an image dynamically. And we can typically get that down to a couple of minutes. Um, the, the flip side of that is we end up rebuilding those because every time a CVE comes in, we literally are forced to go in and we have to update SSHD. We have to go update whatever it is that, you know, SQL, whatever that has the issue. Um, so I, I, it wasn't really so much of a question as a statement that this type of thing occurs. Um, the whether or not the 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 FreeBSD the foundation will have a more proactive view on some of it I don't know I I recognize that we do have the SEC team and they do a pretty good job um, there were there's no finger pointing here 
it's it's more of just a statement. If, if you have comments, I'd love to hear them. Just it's it is what it is. I mean, that's a big question. Um, I know there's some prior art on the Linux side. If you if you go to the uh, the like Quade IO registries and Docker Hub, they actively do security scans of all images that that are, are stored in their systems. I don't know how they do it. I haven't looked. Um, the one of the registry implementations that I use locally is something called Zot. That does security scanning for Linux images. Again, I haven't tried to figure out how that works. I suppose we could work in that direction. For base images, I think that's where Sec Team's approach helps us. The base images are versioned exactly the same as as the the FreeBSD, like four point. I think we're up to four point zero dash release P two, um, and that's included when I build a base image from that from that. Um, version, the image the image will be versioned exactly the same way, slightly contracted. I don't need the dash release in the middle, um, and that's something that package base has been doing for a long time. So you can eyeball and say, well, if patch level two had this CV, then we need to make sure the base images go up to whatever patch level is is going to work for us, but the question kind of covers more than just the base images, and that's where I'm slightly out of my depth. I hope that answered at least some of your question. Can someone sure. briefly answer what the official rules are for, say, ports and packages? Because that's it's a ports field. clearly has its own infrastructure for this, and again, this is not somewhere where I feel like I'm an expert. Not asking you to be right. Uh, for uh, ports, we have the vuln.xml file and port audit fetches that. It's done by the default periodic scripts enabled by default. So that every night the periodic script will check if this file needs updating, fetch a new copy, and run a check against the installed package versions if they are covered by the vulnerable intervals from that file. And then uh, these are the messages you get there there's a vulnerability in one of the packages installed via mail every night oh and it looks like you touched on that in your next question and yeah the question is will we get just the previous the base system uh, routers and security patches get added to that so that if there's a vulnerability in a base package uh, the package just shows up like any other package because like then yes, we could no. build on top of that and um, mm. That would kind of cover that, assuming that the vulnerability database it compares against is kept up to date. Uh, yeah. But that's a ports problem, which is already there, and you already have to deal with that. That some projects do not properly document um, the vulnerabilities and track unless a maintainer remembers to say, "Yeah, this project is known to be flaky about this," and I put in a warning here. Okay. So, Chris, yeah, as in your time with the calls, you've noticed that networking is always a challenge. So, Doug, do you have a secret magic wand on networking <laughs> for your containers, or are you facing all the same issues that we get to challenge ourselves with? So, Go ahead. Um, so, migrating from, from one host to another while running is absolutely not supported. Docker has never supported this, to my knowledge possibly with a snapshotting system they came up with later. But basically the idea with this is that if you're using containers, you're kind of forced to know what state your application is because every time you restart your container, unless it's unless your state is explicitly put in a volume that's not just part of the ephemeral container image for the running image, then you lose it, you know, I restart then it comes with a, 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 just a pristine copy of the original image. If you were putting your state as just um, modifications to that, you're gonna, you're gonna lose them. So um, people have to learn to be clear about where their state is and when they're using 
containers. Um, this is very clear when you're using it on the Linux side. You put them in a separate volume. You tell the system where that volume needs to be mounted, and things work from there. So, for instance, in in Kubernetes, um, there's a cluster-wide kind of storage ecosystem. It's not. It, there's a lot of flexibility there, but within with a small cluster, for instance, I can set things up so that it will create volumes on my TrueNAS server and mount them when it needs to. Um, and if the state goes in that volume, if it migrates from one node to another, it will shut down on node A, be rescheduled to node B, node B will mount that persistent volume and it will continue. So that's that's where things are. And networking, um, like networking, using NetGraph or anything exotic? Well, VNet, NetGraph I'm, and friends. I'm, I'm using, Basically, VNet makes this stuff work. So I use VNet with ePair and, and just off the shelf bridge, um, FreeBSD um, bridges. Don't, haven't looked at Vail. Um, CNI is just a, a very small specification on, on how, how to describe a particular net set of networking things, like how to, what the name of the bridge is, how to set it up, what the address ranges are, how to allocate addresses from on that bridge and so on. And so I'd have a, um, a bare bones implementation of CNI, which does it enough for me to run a container on, on a host. And um, so, yeah, I'm just using bridges with VNet. Got it. And Chris, really does well. that answer your question? <clears throat> uh Jan, if they're not deep dives, you have the short version of these questions. Which of the questions? Uh, you have two on the doc. Uh, uh, yeah, the question is uh, kind of um, packaging uh three based user lens is very close uh, to the basics for the yeah, it's basically the Guts of a FreeBSD user lens. So, how should um, FreeBSD deal with upstream projects like Kubernetes and container registries and so on, which probably don't care about FreeBSD? And I don't mean that in a malicious way, just that they, it's right. irrelevant to them. They have their uh, performance goals, they have their uh, deadlines. And if it's in the way, it will just get ripped out. Uh, we will not uh, wait for FreeBSD to come up with a solution to changes they uh, want to make. So basically, how can we keep that working so that you can right. trust it to at least not break yes. the FreeBSD stuff without yeah. basically taking a snapshot and then forking everything? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so that part of the part of the process around making making significant changes to Kubernetes. Is about managing that expectation. Like, if you're going to do something new, um, then we need to know it's going to be supported. We need to know how that um, you know that it builds, that tests pass, that we can at least have a roadmap on how to get it into continuous integration and running running um, system tests on it. Um, so, as they they do treat this as a life cycle. They're not asking for everything to work magically perfectly on day one. But they do want some commitment for a long term support for that. And if the people that made that commitment disappear, it will get ripped out. But on the flip side, they are open to supporting other operating systems in their ecosystem. They have Windows. Windows is wildly different, but it works. It fits into Kubernetes. It was made to fit. Um, and it's supported by people that maintain it professionally, so it exists. If we want to participate in that, then we need to provide that same level of consistent support. Um, like if something breaks, if, a, if if the FreeBSD part doesn't build anymore, then somebody's gonna step up and fix it. Yep. Um, if, if a change that's made on the FreeBSD side breaks something on the, where the, the money's coming from Linux side, then, we'd better be there to either fix it or back it out and do it but better the next time so yeah that's that's the main concern 
it's other again it's risk management are there other os's beyond windows that have made successes there no i Fair believe enough. that windows is the only is the only um supported um node operating system i feel like solaris could work but nobody's actually tried uh, um, smart OS, we implemented the Docker socket uh, API mm -hmm. so that they had a their Linux API able to run Linux uh, Docker images um, on top of smart OS and they didn't use Docker but they re implemented the API. Interesting. Uh, so, um, which was interesting. Uh, there's a podcast where um, Ryan Cantrell goes into it. Uh, uh, the, um, yeah, um, a eulogy for what Docker once was was a topic, basically. Uh, mm -hmm. And described that at some point, basically, Docker folks wanted to talk to them about licensing uh, their technology. And they were, why? We don't have to license anything. You don't have anything <laughs> uh, uh, we have to license because you do not own the API. You can't copyright an API. Yeah. Thankfully. Uh, hmm? Thankfully. <laughs> yeah, that was, People, I think, yeah. before uh, the recent fights yeah. between uh, Google and uh, Oracle about Java APIs and if basically a certain way to name your string length function can be protected against, uh, yeah. Uh, the rest Jan, of the I suspect storage could be a rabbit hole, but let's uh, look at Chris's question for just a sec. About no, I, have a, I have a short answer for just that question. Actually. Oh, you did perfect, well, yes, excellent, uh, yes. Yeah. Do you want me to address that? So um, it's a great question. Um, should it should the should it be made impossible to to just write outside of the the acceptable boundaries in a container? Um, OCI the OCI runtime config includes um, a flag that says should the root of the root file system be read only, and it defaults to false, but you can set it to true, and that will literally stop you from um, doing um, unacceptable modifications. Um, so typically what will happen, like in Podman, if somebody asks for a, a read-only route, they'll they'll mount tempfs inside it, slash bar run and slash temp and wherever else you need to. So that things that will write will, will, will still work. Um, but it won't, for instance, allow you to make persistent changes in bar db or whatever. Um, so yeah, you can you can ask for your root, for your container root to be redone, and it does work. I implemented this in in OCI jail uh, a few months back because it was part of the Podman test suite, which kind of leads on to the next question in some ways. Perfect segue. Go ahead. So continuous integration. I have an ambition to have. FreeBSD system test to run in Podman's upstream continuous infra in integration infrastructure. Um, we're not there yet. They are kind of open to this. And we have, we run a FreeBSD native build as part of continuous integration. So whenever anyone commits to Linux, part of the, part of the test suite is to make sure it builds FreeBSD and that's something they asked for right up front when I said, you know, this is my roadmap. And they said, we want this to be in continuous integration as soon as possible. So that that um, that's a work in progress. This is one of those areas where having a FreeBSD base image that they can trust that comes from the project would be really helpful. I've had conversations with them and then it's like, this, this random image you want to use as test image, where does that come from? And I said, well, I sort of made it. And they, they do trust me, but in terms of having third parties to, to trust the process, there needs to be a chain of custody. 
Have you been um, reaching out to Colin Percival on that? Because with uh, a a Amazon AMIs, et cetera, he's been focusing yeah. on that for years. I haven't. Well, we had a conversation with release engineering when Colin was temporarily taking care of it. Mm -hmm. um, and their feeling was that we're not quite ready yet. And I think that now that we have package base um, supported by project, it's a lot easier to build images and it should be a relatively small step to integrate um, image building into the standard build workflow. So with package base, as far as I understand it, there's a cron job that runs on a regular basis that sees whether there's a new build. And if there is, it creates the, the package base repo and makes sure it, it's in the on package.freebsd.org on its many mirrors. Nice. So yeah, it's a it's a work in progress, but we are making yeah. progress on that work. And package base is definitely a part of that. And that helps with various upstream people, like the ZOP people want to produce a FreeBSD image, but they don't want it. They want that basic, the base image that it's, that it's built on to be something that they can, you know, show to customers as saying, this is supported. This base image comes from FreeBSD.org uh, and it's supported and it's provable and there's the, you know, um, security scanning and, and signatures and so on. Um, I completely agree. <laughs> yeah, signatures are a big part of it, and they they are a supported part of the container image ecosystem. Chris, your question is pretty broad, but about oh, tooling cross, cross uh, OS agnostic knowledge and tooling. Uh, yeah, so generally, um, I'm just wondering um, what what is what is the how complex is it for people, let's say, that have been working with Linux and Docker and all the usual container technology that you find to actually convert to what, what you're building here? Is there something that they, you know, some sort of knowledge recycling, let's say, is that applicable or do they really start from scratch? Mm -hmm. How much how much overlap is there? I mean, obviously there's gonna be some kind of um yeah similarities because of the technologies but um on the other hand you know um if i remember correctly podman for example there are similarities how to uh run it and use it like docker how does that how does that look like uh for your work that's a great question um so the tooling is is basically identical so podman is intentionally um a, a drop-in replacement for docker as close as they can make it. And um, on the FreeBSD build, it's it's the same Podman as on Linux. The difference is more of a, of a distro level, is what's the name of the base image? How do I install stuff, like extra packages into that base image? And you have to deal with that. If, you're, if I pick a Fedora base image, then I have to use, I don't know, RPM or, or, or whatever the, the current wrapper on top of RPM is. If I'm taking a Ubuntu image, it's probably, oh, I, don't, I forget. It's a long time since I've used Ubuntu. But yeah, it's, so those aspects are kind of the same if you're thinking about moving from a Linux to a FreeBSD image. You have to learn the names of what, what base images there are and what facilities they provide and how to install stuff. And so it's just sort of, it's, it's broadly similar. You're going to use you're going to pick a base image and use PKG to in, to install stuff into that image. Um, it sounds like things... for a user to move over, it wouldn't be much harder than moving between a dissimilar distribution, like between CentOS to, and to a large extent, yes, Ubuntu or something. Yeah, there are feature gaps. I mean, you can do a lot more fine grained security and resource limitations than we than we support right now. But I do think that we have um, some support for those primitives in base. They're just not exposed in the implementation that of OCI. It's just uh, one of the questions I collected ahead of time below in the document. That's how can we maybe make it possible to access FreeBSD specific features 
like for example, the mandatory access control framework and the file system level firewalling. Here, uh, you get a firewall uh, to this so that you could have a, and the other problem I think is that we do not have uh, right now a UID and GID renumbering virtual file system. We lost that in FreeBSD7. Right. Uh, it was available up to six. We are UMAP FS, but the code has been uh, sacrificed to uh, the gods of giantless kernel. <laughs> yep. uh, because nobody cared about it at the time um, to move that code forward. And we kind of need something like that back to uh, be able to um, run multiple instances of uh, the same image without recursively re-owning uh, uh, all the files, which is right. not something you want yeah. to do uh, for each startup at worst to basically, oh, this is the new uh, UID, GID range for this instantiation of this uh, yeah. container. Yep. You don't want to run a change re uh, owner recursive. Yeah, yeah. Really so a quick point of order. We're at about an hour and Doug, thank you so, so much. I don't know if you have a time constraint or others because I do want to. My wife just kind of put, poked her head around to look at me. Your dinner is ready type of. Um, oh, that, yes. Uh, then I, I totally respect that. Um, <laughs> the priorities, yeah. we can, so we can, we can tie up some things and, um, and maybe try and try and okay. finish up soon. And one broader question would, would, should I consider moving the uh, the jail call to a slot that uh, suits you better, or is this a topic worthy of its own call? Or I feel what? like what do you I feel think like would this help? is there's a huge overlap between the OCI runtime work and and jails in general. Um, so I feel like I could participate. In, you know, but you do have a conflict. Order jails call, but I have a conflict. Okay, you know? well, let's. Um, Talk about that offline. Yeah. Uh, other quick questions, and I'm going to scan through the doc here. Uh, oh, and there's a nice organized list that's built out. Okay, so uh, Doug, you have the floor. Anything you want to ask us or share or request for help on? It's a good question. So we we talked a bit about um, the CNI um networking infrastructure and you know i to get this thing seeded i basically did everything myself i built i ported all the pieces i made implementations of the the, the missing things to to piece it all together um but at some point i need to ask for help for instance on podman they started they they used the the cni plugin system for a long time but they have an in-house Rust-based implementation, which is substantially faster, and it's tuned just for what they need. Um, they asked me whether I whether I plan to port that, and I'm wondering whether I have the bandwidth to do it. So, yeah, if somebody could come up with um, a commitment to think about uh, porting the, some of these extra pieces that I haven't been able to get to. I'm thinking about something called Netavark, which is a Rust-based container networking implementation that fundamentally the Podman team would like to be the only only supported networking infrastructure. Um, it Netavark, N-E-T-A-V-A-R-K. N-E-T-A-V-A-R-K? Uh, -E yeah. Um, Do you have yeah. a, a post-it note of these little projects or could you... Mail I could come up with a, a small list. Sure, I think uh, uh, we'll yeah. throw it in the that, review yeah. or somewhere. Just, just yeah, let yeah. that work. <laughs> but it, fundamentally, I'd like to It'll see help. more people get involved with with fixing stuff in the in the Podman port and sending stuff upstream. They are really welcoming, and they need more people that don't work for Red Hat to be contributors to their project. I feel yes, sir. Well, if you have dinner on the table, uh, I welcome 
everyone to interject with final words. I'm happy to stick around for a little bit. Uh, Mark, um, you argue you've been quiet. Short uh, question. Uh, have you seen what I've been doing with ZFS and uh, read only clones to make it a possible to basically replace base system and package set and process the data without uh, actually moving the data uh, yeah. by doing slightly unnatural things to ZFS uh, inheritance relationships so that the immutable stuff is yeah. not uh, right. current, but yeah, has yeah. the uh, cousin or sibling of the persistent yeah. stuff, but still inherits the same mount point. So, Doug, have you seen uh, that? It's documented look in at the OpenZFS minutes. Share your uh, opinion. That would be quite useful to me. I haven't looked at your work. I will say that the I use ZFS as the back end for, for container image storage. And it uses underneath it, it each con, container images are built in layers. You build you know, like a, a base image and maybe a, a, something that packages something on top or makes a modification. And they can be stacked. And Underneath the hood, I used, uh, I didn't write it. It was written for Docker back yonks ago, but this is the implementation that I use. It uses ZFS um, snapshots and clones to manage that stacking, and it works really well. Um, can you, I'm not sure how that's, whether that's similar to your work, but is that something you can link to? Fantastic. I broke the, prob the problem with the layered approach is that while it does get you the ability to write out individual files and so on. What it uh, yeah. breaks is that you can't update a middle layer or especially the lowest yeah. layer yeah. without yeah. having to reapply everything. And what I do is I sure. okay, Jan, break uh, it up and use I'll link file. him the, the minutes yeah. about that. Let's deep dive that separately because that's a very it's mm -hmm. very cool what you're doing. No question. So I don't mm -hmm. I want to give it uh the proper attention it needs. And again, Doug has dinner on the table. So oh <laughs> uh Chris, and it looks like, yeah, uh, yeah, we Greg has had to leave. But any final thoughts and questions beyond uh, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for your work. I, I, I am very impressed with what you've described here. And I hope we can all help in various ways. So others? I don't have anything coming to mind if anybody else has questions on things that they would like to do with Podman that whether it um, that it perhaps doesn't do already I'm always interested in, in trying to support people that are prepared to make that zero to one step of trying this stuff out Darky comment I would like to build it on 14 from ports yeah um <laughs> I, I fixed, know it block I by fixed the build break yeah it, so because I'm obstinate, I use this thing called Basil to build OCI jail. Basil's been broken since the summer in um, for 14. I fixed that um, this week. Oh, I great. shipped the fix. It should come out of the package building machine. I don't know how that long how long that takes. A few days, and then OCI jail Podman should build. Yeah, great. Do you have a preferred Basically, IRC the, channel or place to find you? I kind of vaguely hang around on the um, OCI Slack and okay. on the the not really a uh, an IRC person. Okay. Um, yeah. The OCI one Slack. One question is, also from from sorry. Please. One one question from my side. If we want to dig into your work, is there any documentation or tutorials that you can recommend that can help people get started? I wrote an article on Medium back in January. Is that January? Yeah, January this year, um, which kind of covers the basics. I wrote, um, there was some interest in the FreeBSD journal on me writing an article on FreeBSD images, uh, and I have a draft for that. Cool. Well, uh... Many of the members present have determined that we could go on all day about topics like this, so yeah. it's probably best to <laughs> cut it off now. But it again, seems like thank we're, you we're so looking much for ahead. another another version of this meeting in the future to try and drain out this this queue of questions. 
Thank you for your time, Doug. It's nice to nice Thanks, to hear Doug. from you again. It's been a long time. I was about to ask. Yeah, yeah you are both long timers, and Rod's <laughs> here in town. Oh, yes. He's active, and it's like, well, <laughs> gang's all here. <laughs> yep. It's been a long time since I've heard the patch kit mentioned. <laughs> yeah, I, my I think my thirtieth anniversary of having a FreeBSD commit bit is next year. Scary. Yeah, Jordan Hubbard was my. Uh, um, yeah, let's just say that was interesting. Here's your commit. Here's your commit bit. Have fun. Don't break anything. And if you do, you're going to get in trouble. Yeah, I had that same conversation with John. <laughs> yeah, cool. Well, profound right. thanks. Thanks, and everyone. Yeah, let's uh, see where this takes us all. Thank you. All right. Take okay. care. Thank you.